Hi, I'm Christopher Warnock of Renaissance Astrology, and today this video is going to focus on the question, why are astrological readings inaccurate from time to time? Um, you know, this is a question that we as traditional astrologers really need to face squarely. Um, you know, the predictions are often accurate. In fact, sometimes they're incredibly, uh, give amazing detail, but they're not 100%. Um, but, you know, accepting there's even some errors uh, feels problematic because according to the current atheistic, materialistic, nihilist worldview, astrological uh, prediction is impossible. First, the atheistic materialist uh, would assert that there's no spiritual anything. So an art like astrology that relies on spiritual causality, you know, is obviously impossible in, in that view. Next, uh, as nihilist, it's basically an article of faith to them that, you know, everything is random and meaningless. Again, that makes it impossible to predict anything except through you know, a material energetic causality. So again, astrology just, it's, it's impossible. So it seems like, you know, if we open even any a chink in that armor and admit that it's, you know, less than 100% accurate, then, you know, we're kind of giving the whole thing away, which is simply not true. Uh, in fact, what it what happens is that the fact that astrology, uh, particularly horror astrology, which is very focused and precise, can give us such accurate and in incredibly, you know, focused readings, shows us the holes in atheistic materialism and shows this view of reality, which is basically predominant, though often unconscious with people nowadays, is not a very accurate mapping of reality. Um, but, you know, that being said, um, traditional astrology, like I said, particularly horary, which is the most focused form and most, I think, most accurate in my experience, is not always accurate. Um, now, it would be nice for marketing, for our ego, and to fend off the athe atheistic materialists. Um, Again, their argument is going to be, well, if it's not 100%, it's worthless, even though they don't hold themselves to that same standard. Um, but it's real. It's working in the real world. It's being done by real people. So it obviously could never be 100% accurate. But this isn't to say it's not useful. Um, it's certainly more accurate, I think, than economic prediction. And even reasonably accurate prediction of the future, it's not only incredible, but it's sufficient to be extremely helpful. You just have to take it with a grain of salt. What I like to do when I do a reading is that, you know, that the, the querent or the client is taking this as one piece of information in the puzzle and using it as a way to get sort of an objective view of the circumstances and then uh, help them make their decision. I would be very nervous if someone came to me and said, no, don't care what you do. I'm not going to look at anything else. Whatever you say, I'm going to do. That would make me a bit nervous. Um, and I, I think that's not the best way to use it. So um, one of the reasons that I do all my readings and writing is so that I have a record of them. And so well, when I get feedback and when I look back at something, I can see what my, what my reading said. And it's much more objective doing it this way. It's very easy to kind of uh, cloud it, you know, or, or move the, oh, I think I, I predicted this, or I think I predicted that, either in a negative or positive way. When you've got it in writing, that way you've got the actual reading before you know what the results are. That's real prediction. Uh, the clients will tend to think that you're either 110% accurate or 0% accurate. They're, they're not usually giving you a very nuanced uh, understanding of it. Um, and so, again, that's why they're, they're having it in writing is useful. And then once you get the results, then you can record it. And I have hundreds and hundreds of uh, analysis where I did, didn't know the results, did the reading, and then I got the uh, results back and I've kept a record of it. So that's very, very useful. Um, so... When we proceed to the question of why is a chart inaccurate, if you look at it and the reading's inaccurate, then often, you know, really the, the, it's the astrologer is the weak link. The astrologer read the chart wrong. I mean, this is a little bit of a harsh way to put it, though, because charts generally have multiple plausible readings. So, um, you know, you can look back with hindsight and say, oh, you know, I took option A when it really should have been option B. I mean, that's why it's not unusual for me to hedge you know, to say, well, I think this is likely, but it's also not impossible that this happens. Um, but definitely what you might call pilot error accounts for a good deal of inaccuracy. Um, now, another possibility for error would seem to be free will. I mean, because the idea is, well, the, the chart is faded, but the free will can come in and maybe you could choose to do something or go against fate. Um, certainly, moderns really want to believe in, in, in free will. Um, and now we could reasonably question how much free choice we really exercise, you know, how much free will really exists when generally we're just following our desires, our passions, our conditioning, memes, you know, duress, that sort of thing. 
Um, but traditional astrology recognizes that both fate and free will are operating simultaneously, even if free will is really more of a potential uh, at times than, than, uh, than something that's really in, in play. Um, now normally when a querent asks a horary, it's because they don't have an easy way to exert their will. Uh, they're thwarted or they're really unsure of the outcome. They're not sure how to exercise it. So these are really faded circumstances. Um, a question like, should I cross the street, is really not a very good horary question because it's too easy and it's too much under the control of the querent. Um, so that's something to think about in terms of horaries. Now people don't usually ask that, really easy stuff, but another typical question is, you know, will somebody contact me? Um, Typically, that question is used as a way to avoid asking the root question, which is, am I going to have a committed relationship with the person? And the context is just so ephemeral and so easy nowadays with social media and phones and all sorts of stuff like that. It's just, it's, it's too ephemeral and too much out of the control of a person to really be a good, a good horary. Um, so that kind of question can be inaccurate. But generally, the, the types of questions people are asking and the reality of the situations that people find themselves in, they're very faded. And in any case, the free will is something that's taken into consideration in the chart that's showing up there as well. So um, really, there's a certain amount of that, but really that's not, well, it seems like an obvious answer, to, you know, uh, uh, explanation to a modern person that's really hipped on free will. It's really not that... Um, not that big a deal. Um, but really the more difficult scenario to explain is when the chart itself appears to give the wrong answer. You know, when the chart factors are so strong and so obvious that it appears to be a negative or positive answer, it's clear yet the end result is definitely different. That is much more problematic. It doesn't happen that often, but it certainly it certainly comes up from time to time. You know, for example, in a horary, if the significators of the querent and the quested were in detriment, these are the representing the, the people they're asking about. They're separating from an opposition, and yet the querent gets their what they want. That would be very confusing to see all these negative factors and get a positive result. Um, so you know, at first thing we need to do is make sure that the full details have been received. Have we gotten all the information about this? Are we really getting the full situation as, and has the situation fully unfolded yet? Are we just preliminary and, and the, the chart's accurate but we just have to wait till it unfolds? So that's something we need to think about. Nevertheless, again, we have these inexplicable charts. They're giving A as the answer and then the result is B. So, so what do we do with those? What's happening? Now, there's a, a very interesting quote that I sort of stumbled across from the aphorisms of Jerome Cardin. This is a, a 17th century um, from Lilly, William Lilly is again a famous English horror astrologer and uh, Coley is a, was sort of his student of uh, anime astrologia, sort of the, it's called the soul of astrology. And that includes a bunch of aphorisms. And Cardan's 18th aphorism says, when, when true genitors, or basically this is a natal chart, but basically when charts um, are exactly taken, you know, there's a good chart, taken in accents prove false or absurd and not agreeable to the thing signified, says they are to be accounted monstrous, to be avoided as anatomists do monstrous bodies in their dissections as they overthrow art. So essentially what it's saying is that the, in the reality is not conforming to the chart, that the pattern reflected in the chart is not reflected in the reality. But nevertheless, that doesn't throw everything out. So I, I think that's something to, to, to keep in mind. So that's something, obviously, this isn't the first time this has come up, the traditional astrologers were aware of this as a problem, and they're something that they're concerned about. But but what's happening? What's going on? Why doesn't the reality conform to the chart or vice versa? So really, we have to dive in. It's a really a very complex problem and a very complex uh, reality. Um, so really, what is our underlying view of what the chart represents? Is the chart some sort of map of energy fields? Are the planets beaming some sort of energy at us? Certainly, this would be the unconscious assumption that of atheistic materialism. I mean, we're pretty much operating on that. I mean, unconsciously, whatever our conscious spiritual outlook is, the atheistic materialism that thinks there's only matter and energy is, is almost always lurking under there. It's also a pretty respectable answer from a, from a traditional astrology standpoint. For example, if you look at the Arabic medieval astrologer Al-Kindi, he wrote a book called On the Stellar Rays. And this gives a, a causality of that everything puts out these sort of rays, but they're spiritual, not electromagnetic. Um, so again, this is you know this is a, a potential uh, potentially valid view. Um, 
And we can see how it might work for natal astrology. The planets at their time of birth are beaming something at you and that affects you. And, you know, that's the, what becomes problematic, though, is when you think about horary. So I don't know how you'd have beams or fields or whatever that reflect the question. The time of the question then reflects the answer. I mean, that that's much more to do with the, the overall patterning of the universe. And so that uh, traditional view is the one that I tend to go with. Again, it's a preference. It's not to say it's right or wrong. I just find that this is a useful way of thinking about things. And the, the classic presentation of it is Plotinus and his Aeneids. And Aeneid uh, 2, Treatise 3, is called on whether the stars are causes. And so Plotinus comes back and says, no, the stars themselves are not the direct cause of events. What they're doing is they're giving signs. And he says, but if these planets give signs of things, um, why is that? And he says, it's because of the spiritual sympathy and interconnection of the cosmos that the stars and other forms of divination can predict the future. Um, and he analogizes the stars and planets to characters being written on the heavens and that signify what's happening. Um, and, you know, if we understand the, uh, the patterning of the individual pieces, we can see the patterning of the whole. And so, so everything is linked. All things are full of signs indicating each other. And that's how we can uh, do divination uh, from all sorts of things. He says from birds and living creatures, um, you know, from the flight of birds, all sorts of different types of omens. And so because the universe is connected, because everything is connected in the all, it's that one principle is that the universe is itself a single complex living creature, is what Plotinus says. So this is this sort of, and it's also taken up in Hermetic philosophy, but this is also Neoplatonic, is that the, because everything is connected to the one and interconnected, then you're, we're able to do prediction. And it's spiritual connections, not a material causality. So when we focus in on uh, astrology, my sense of it is, is that the heavenly cycles what we're seeing as we look at the, the, the planets and the orbits and, the, and how they relate to each other, we're seeing them reflecting these underlying spiritual cycles. And these are the same spiritual cycles that are in play for earthly events. And the reason we look at the heavenly cycles is that they're very clear and obvious. Um, they're very regular. We can look a thousand years in the past, a thousand years in the future, and we can see the, the, the incredible you know, patterning of these cycles. So it gives us a very obvious, almost like a clock, because it's an incredible way to see these cycles in a very clear fashion. Um, but, but what I've kind of divined or decided is that the heavenly cycles are only reflecting this discrete band of spiritual cycles. And so the events often, but don't always follow these patterns. The other patterns of cycles govern on occasion. And I think this is something I haven't heard from anybody else. There's a tendency to assume, oh, it's all there. Everything is predicted. Nothing falls outside the heavenly cycles. And I think that's not correct. I think it's sort of like almost like electromagnetic magnetic band. It's like, well, one wavelength or one series of wavelengths. Like we're only seeing the red and orange and we're not seeing the, the purple and we're not seeing into the ultraviolet band. So um, we can think about this. One way to get insight is to come from another direction, which is just to consider the different interlocking cycles of fate. I mean, when you do an election, this is a, a, you know, choosing a time, date, and place that's most auspicious to do something. Well, the thing about that is, and that's going to depend also on your birth chart. It's going to depend on the fate of your family, your neighborhood, your province or state, your country, the, the economy, the world. I mean, all these things are going on simultaneously. So even if you get a good election, it's positive. You might have negative cycles going on, and that's going to affect you as well. You know, one of my examples, I'd say, you know, if you had a great natal chart, did a great election in Poland in 1939, you would get to be a refugee instead of being dead. So instead of being able to look at the chart, or Bill Gates's chart is a good example of that. I mean, if you look at Bill Gates, richest man in the world, his second house is, you know, it's good, but it's not spectacularly, incredibly amazing, like the richest man in the world, billionaire but he was in the right place at the right time. Um, so these other cycles of faith that were going on that, that led to him being the, the, the biggest billionaire. And looking at his chart, wouldn't, you wouldn't say, oh, this guy's definitely going to be a billionaire. So I think that that gives us an understanding of the complexities of what's going on. And I think the reality is, is that, yes, the heavenly cycles you know, are, are, are um, governing or, or influencing or basically reflecting the spiritual cycles, similar spiritual cycles, but that's not the entire picture. There's a lot more going on. And so 
you know, we've had a lot of other explanations, like I said, pilot error, you know, just inaccuracies, you know, the way the, the, you know, free will, all these are problems. But there's this basic problem here of, you know, from time to time, we're going to get inaccurate charts because the chart itself is not um, looking at the cycle that's actually in control. So you might, you might call it miraculous, you might just say that there's cycles that are going on that we're not aware of. I mean, there's bigger cycles, celestial cycles, that aren't necessarily going to be reflected in the chart. For example, there's a cycle that controls, you know, basically uh, glaciations because it depends on how the, the orbit of the Earth and the Sun and everything, but that's like a 100,000 year cycle. And that's not something we're going to be able to see on the chart yet. Never said, if it's, if, you, if it's glaciated, if you've got an ice age, obviously that's going to come into play. So, um, again, I think it's something we need to face is that we're not 100%. And in basically facing up to that and saying, no, sometimes it's inaccurate, we can nevertheless get an understanding of the complexities of what we're dealing with and then a further appreciation of how uh, accurate the charts actually are and how useful they are. Uh, so I hope that was uh, useful and, and something, but I've been thinking about this for a while, and um, I hope that, uh, that this will be useful for other astrologers and for people just thinking about what's actually going on in astrological prediction.